everyone for coming. Thanks, Hillary, for having me. I'm going to do my best to get through what I think are the most important slides, just in case we run short on time. I will also take questions at the end, so if you think of something and want to jot it down, that might be the best way to make sure we get through the material. Um, I do want to say, before I get into the slides, that appeals are so, so important in this area of practice, in this area of the law. Um, there's about 365,000 pending claims at VA, according to their Monday morning work report that I checked earlier this week. But there's also almost or over 265,000 appeals pending. So for about every four claims that's pending, there's three appeals that are also pending. Appealing is very, very important, um, especially when you think about the duty to assist ideas that we spoke about earlier this morning. Um, when you file a claim and you get an initial denial, it does not mean that VA will have done all that it was supposed to do to help you substantiate your claim. So you need to appeal it. You need to ask for more assistance um, or ask someone to look at the case again if a, if a mistake was made. Um, it's just very important to continue on with the claim uh, for the purpose of hopefully getting some success down the line. So a, a quick overview. Hillary kind of touched on this. We're first going to talk about legacy appeals, which is the system that was in effect until February 19th, 2019, just last month. A lot of those cases will still be pending, so you will see them out there for quite a while. Um, any decision made prior to February 19th, 2019 is considered in legacy, unless it was a ramp decision. We'll get to what ramp is later on. Um, and appeals issued, or I'm sorry, decisions issued after that data in the new system. So be mindful of the date, be, be mindful of when the decision was made, and if the client or the veteran has not opted into the new system, there are plenty of legacy cases out there. So the rules for legacy still matter quite a bit. We're also going to touch on the new system, obviously. It's brand new. Um, I don't have a ton of data about it, but I'll do my best to share what I've learned so far in the four weeks that we've been exposed to it and with that we've been working with it. I was going to touch on RAMP, which I'll get to later, but I'm probably going to cruise through most of that material because RAMP was a transitional program that was in place to help guide VA to transition from the legacy system to the new system. It's not quite as relevant anymore given that the new system is in effect. And finally, I'm going to try to give some comparisons between the old and the new system. So one of the biggest things, one of the biggest challenges that's posed by the new system is not just learning it, but learning when it might be a good idea to opt into it or when it might be a better idea even to stay away from it. It is supposed to streamline appeals. It's supposed to give veterans more choices. I think it does that, but it does come with some setbacks as well, depending on what the circumstances of your case are. This is a quick graphic we have. This is what the legacy appeal system looked like. It looks kind of complicated, um, at least it did to me when I was first learning this area, but what you can tell from this, I want you to focus on the white box on the left. You can see that the claim process follows in one path. So when you file a claim, after that is a decision. After that is a notice of disagreement and so on. Everyone takes the same path. That is not the same with the new system, so keep that in mind. And I'm going to break down all of the different stages of the legacy claims process now. Um, good to know that after receiving a final decision from the Board of Veterans' Appeals, which is bottom center here, you can appeal to the court of uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims and then higher up. Those courts are outside of VA, as the earlier presenters were explaining. So the first thing you do when you're filing a claim is file the claim. File it on the claim form. VA has a specific form that you need to use in order for them to properly process your claim. It's the 21-526 or the 21-526EZ, um, two separate forms that you can use. And these can be submitted to the regional offices or to the Evidence Intake Center in Janesville, Wisconsin, which is a centralized mailing location where VA processes their incoming mail. You can also submit an intent to file a claim that's not on this form, um, and you can advise VA that within a year you intend to file a claim for a certain type of benefits. That will help preserve an effective date, but you must file the claim within that year. So if you file the intent to file and you miss the one year claim filing, you have to start over again. But it is good to know that if you're thinking about filing a claim, you don't quite have all the details worked out, you can do the intent to file as a way to preserve the earliest effective date possible for the client. You must, in the claim, specify what you are seeking compensation for. Um, there are not a lot of requirements for claims. You do not have to submit 
uh, corroborating evidence. You don't need to submit all of your evidence right up front. You do have to explain to VA, though, what it is that you're seeking benefits for. Are you looking for service connection for a particular disability? What disability do you have? What are the symptoms that you have? Those are always helpful. For instance, if you're filing a claim for service connection for a traumatic brain injury, you might want to advise VA right up front what residuals you have due to the traumatic brain injury. That will get them thinking about the best ways to develop the case, to order nexus evidence if they decide that that's warranted, and what it actually is that you're looking to get paid for. After the claim is filed, this is when the duty to assist kicks in. We've talked about this uh, quite a bit this morning. Um, the duty to assist requires VA to go out and get evidence that will help support your claim if you don't have it. So if you file the claim and you indicate, um, I'm seeking service connection for a traumatic brain injury, please look at my service records. They will show that I was injured or you know, please consider getting my medical records. I'm treated at the following facilities. If you give them that information, that will trigger their duty to assist you by getting, helping you get the information. And hopefully it contains information that's relevant to your success on the claim. A VA exam or a compensation and pension exam might be necessary to adjudicate the claim. For instance, if the issue is nexus, if it's not disputed that you had an in-service event and it's not disputed that you have a current disability, but there's no evidence of a link between the two, VA might have to go out and get a medical opinion. Again, we talked about this this morning. Um, but this is the kind of things you want to see after your claim is filed. And if you end up getting a rating decision and these steps aren't followed, that is how you know you should appeal. If you think that VA did not do their due diligence in getting your records, if they didn't do the things you asked them to do, if they didn't look at the evidence that you wanted them to look at, and they make a decision, you must appeal it. Um, that's the only way you're going to keep your effective date and keep pursuing your claim unless you refile it. So what is a rating decision? It's the initial decision on a claim. It's issued by the regional office. It contains an explanation of the reasons that the decision was being made, um, but in my experience, they're not very descriptive. They're not extremely informative. Sometimes the rating decision just says, we're denying the claim because the evidence doesn't show that you were injured in service, or we're denying the claim because there's no evidence that your condition is worse now than it was five years ago, so you don't get an increased rating. Sometimes that's all they say. They do give a list of the evidence that they uh, purportedly considered. Sometimes they even list some of the requirements or the elements for the claim, but there's not a ton of information there. There's not a ton of guidance for the veteran in terms of what additional is needed to substantiate the claim, at least in the legacy decisions. Um, and so these are not always super helpful, but another reason why you should appeal, because there might be a chance to ultimately prevail um, if you're able to gather the evidence that you need. You have one year from the date of a rating decision to file an appeal. The deadlines are very important. Stick to them. Um, I know that sometimes people ask for uh, extensions of time and have gotten those granted. I wouldn't recommend it. Please be mindful that when you get a rating decision from one year from that date, that's your deadline to appeal. The way that you appeal a rating decision is through a notice of disagreement. This needs to be on a specific form also. It's VA form 21-0958. And in the decision, or I'm sorry, in the notice of disagreement, similar to your claim, you need to specify what it is you disagree with. So for instance, if you get a rating decision that adjudicates multiple claims or multiple um, issues that you've raised, if you want to appeal all of them, you should list them. You should explain, these are the things that I take issue with. This is what I disagree with. The VA form for the Notice of Disagreement has a separate or a second page that contains boxes and you can specifically identify this is the issue that's in dispute. Um, if, it's an, if, if it's a service connection issue, you can check a box that says service connection. If it's an effective date issue, you can check a box that says effective date. But you have to explain or at least you know, put VA on notice as to what you're disagreeing with. This is also sent to the regional office, your notice of disagreement, or alternatively to the evidence intake center. So at this stage, after you filed your notice of disagreement, your first step in appealing the adverse decision that you received, two, uh, you have two choices. You can make these choices on the notice of disagreement form. You can either select decision review officer review or traditional review of your appeal. The decision review officer option comes with the promise that VA will have um, a different adjudicator, usually a more experienced adjudicator, look at your claim. 
Um, this is, you know, the, the option that we usually go with, but, you know, obviously it depends on your case. Um, you are able to have a hearing or a conference with the decision review officer that gets assigned your appeal. So that's a nice option. Sometimes you can spend the time to talk with the, with the DRO officer on the phone and you can point you know, their attention to um, your couple really important pieces of evidence that you've already submitted if you want them to think extra long and hard about those things. Um, you can indicate what issues matter the most to you. So maybe you've appealed five issues, but there's a couple in particular that you think are really ready for a grant. You can do that in the conference. Um, the drawback to a conference, as with most um, conference or hearing type options is that it's going to take longer in an already very long system. So um, we're thinking about, but at the same time, sometimes those conferences can be fruitful to see what VA is thinking about the appeal. Or you can select traditional review. This just means that someone else is going to look at the case. So someone else is going to make a new rating decision. Um, it's not under the guise of a more experienced adjudicator. It's just somebody else. Um, you don't have the option to elect a DRO conference if you are not choosing the DRO option, which is the decision review officer. Um, so think about that before you elect traditional review, but you might save on time if you go with traditional. I talked a little bit about these details already, but the next thing that will happen if you select DRO review of your appeal or of your notice of disagreement at this point um, is that the RO will issue a DRO rating decision. So you're going to get a second rating decision after you file your notice of disagreement. It's going to be by the new adjudicator that picks up on the case, um, but it's functionally the same as a rating decision. You still have one year to appeal. You still must appeal within a year. If you get another adverse decision, um, if you are still finding that you think it was an error, if you think that VA hasn't satisfied their duty to assist, you would need to appeal within one year of that new decision. And then it's going to finally move on to the next step. So you've already spent uh, quite a bit of time on the case, and we're going to spend more time. But here are the things that you need to do to keep it going. Um, after you file another notice of disagreement with your second rating decision, um, that's the product sometimes of the DRO or of the new reviewer, you're going to get a statement of the case from VA. Um, the statement of the case is just a long rating decision. It will continue the previous denial. Usually these are, are much, much longer though, and they will recite at length a lot of regulations and laws that VA has decided apply in your case. Um, if, if at the point between filing your notice of disagreement and getting your statement of the case, VA decides that it can issue a grant, maybe you've submitted more evidence that persuades them, uh, maybe they have taken a second look and they agree that some of your claims can be granted, they will have to issue a rating decision that does the grants. So the statement of the case will contain the denials, but if VA decides that they have a favorable decision to make, they will do so via a rating decision. Um, we see a lot at this stage that sometimes VA will want to issue a partial grant. So for instance, say you're filing a claim for an increased rating for a, an already service-connected back condition. So the issue of severity um, is really what you're pushing. If your rating is at 10% and you filed a notice of disagreement with the rating decision that denied you a rating higher than 10% and you're moving on to the statement of the case phase and VA decides, well, this person should have a 20% but no higher. What they'll do is they'll issue a rating decision to cover the grant, the grant of 10 to 20, and they'll issue a statement of the case to the extent that a rating higher than 20 is denied. So they'll split it. Um, the rating decision, you, you usually don't have to appeal as long as the portion of the case that's being denied or the portion of the issue that's being denied is continued in the statement of the case. Then what you want to do is appeal the statement of the case. Again, these are sometimes include more detail as to why the claim is being denied, but not always. These are longer decisions, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are more descriptive in terms of what's going on in the, uh, in the specific person's case. So they will cite to more laws and regulations, but at the bottom of the decision, they will still include the reasons for making the decision and they might not explain what additional evidence is needed, why exactly the evidence that's been submitted is not enough. Um, these can still be vague at this process. If you want to appeal a statement of the case, um, if you still disagree with the way that VA is deciding the case, and you likely will, you'll need to file within 60 days an appeal. So before, with a rating decision, you had one year to decide whether to file an appeal and to file one. 
Now you only have 60 days. And you do an appeal or you, you perfect an appeal um, after a statement of the case by filing what's called the VA Form 9. So this is another specific form. It's another form that requires you to, con that is, is needed to continue on with your appeal. Uh, but this is what perfects your appeal to the Board of Veterans Appeals, which is the highest adjudicator within the VA. Um, at this stage, you can also request a hearing with the board. We'll talk about hearings later. Um, but similar to a, a DRO conference, keep in mind that a hearing might be a useful way to get testimony in the record. Um, it also comes with the primary drawback of a delay. It takes a very long time for hearings to get scheduled, and you should think about whether what will be said at the hearing could not also be reduced to writing and submitted to VA that way. They have to consider written testimony and oral testimony the same way. Again, you have an option to appeal only certain denials in the statement of the case. So if you have multiple issues and claims pending, you can call out the ones that you don't really want to pursue anymore. Um, maybe things have changed, but you still have certain items that you really want to continue appealing. So you should be specific about that. Um, it just helps to narrow in on what the focus should be in terms of proceeding on with the appeal. Sometimes after uh, VA-9 is filed, you will receive a supplemental statement of the case. This is a unique kind of uh, decision because it's just a continuation of the denial that was already previously issued via the statement of the case, and you are not required to appeal it. Usually what happens that prompts the issuance of a supplemental statement of the case is that you might submit more evidence when you file your VA-9 or your substantive appeal. And anytime you do that, anytime you introduce new ev evidence in the legacy process, VA will consider it and then kick back to you a supplemental statement of the case which will say, we've considered that new evidence but we are still denying the claim. Um, Something that we have seen that we try to avoid, of course, because we do not want more delay in this process than, frankly, there already is, is that multiple SSOCs, supplemental statements of the case, can be issued. So if you want to respond to a supplemental statement of the case, you may. Your response is not required. You may do so in 30 days. But if you continue to submit more evidence, VA is going to have to keep issuing supplemental statements of the case with respect to that new evidence. So that's something to keep in mind at this stage. You do have the opportunity to submit more evidence when your case proceeds to the board, um, or you may have already submitted all the evidence that you had by the time your case gets to the SSOC stage. But be mindful that anytime you submit anything new at this stage, you're going to have to wait for the uh, preparation of a supplemental statement of the case, which you don't have to appeal, but it's just another step that's um, going to clog up the appeal. Board hearings. This is what you can choose if you want at the VA-9 stage. So you can indicate in your substantive appeal to the board that you want a certain kind of hearing. There are three types and all of them pertain to where the hearing is going to be held. You can have a video conference hearing with a judge at the um, Board of Veterans Appeals. This will require you to go to your local regional office and sort of Skype with the board judge. Um, these can be effective and they're probably the ones that take the shortest amount of time to schedule because it doesn't require any travel on the part of the board judge. It requires the least amount of travel um, on your part usually. You just need to attend the regional office. These can still take a while. Um, the lines are long the day of sometimes, depending on the regional office and depending on the day. So if, again, if, if you really want the hearing, just be uh, mindful of the delay that might occur if you ask for a hearing, even this video conference option. You can also opt for a hearing in Washington, D.C., if that's your style, if that's something that works out for you, if you're in the area. Um, but this requires you to travel to D.C. to attend the hearing live with the board judge. You can also ask for a hearing at your local regional office, which is what we call a travel board hearing. This is when the board will actually come to your regional office. That will take the longest to schedule because it requires the board judges to travel much farther. They're already in Washington, D.C. If they've got to travel to you, um, there can be scheduling nightmares that come up with these. So finally, you get a decision from the Board of Veterans' Appeals. Hopefully it's a grant. That's one thing that the board can do. So after all of this appealing, after all of the steps that you've taken, meeting all the deadlines, you could get a board decision that just grants the claim, grants the benefits that you're seeking, and that would be great. 
Uh, the board can also deny things, just like the regional office had before, but they are required to issue a decision that contains uh, much more robust reasons and bases. They have to explain uh, what evidence they've considered, if it's relevant and material and favorable to your case. They have to explain why it's not enough, why they don't disagree, why they, why they don't agree with it, what negative evidence they agree with more. They have to do a much more concrete explanation than the regional office does. The board can also remand issues, and we see this a lot in the context of the duty to assist. So by the time the case gets to the board, it might be the case that the regional office has not ensured that the file was updated in terms of treatment records, service records, examinations, anything that is needed to make a decision on the claim. If the board identifies a deficiency like that in the evidence, they're going to send the case back to the regional office to, with specific instructions as to what to obtain so that the board can make a full decision on the claim. The board can also refer or dismiss issues. So a referral is if the board decides that they don't really have jurisdiction over the issue that's before them. So sometimes um, you might be pursuing a claim for service connection um, and maybe at the very end stages of your appeal, just before the board made a decision, you raised another issue. Um, maybe you raised a secondary service connection issue or a totally new um, issue related to the claim that you are pursuing. But the regional office hasn't had a chance to evaluate it, assess it, make a decision on that raised issue. The board might say that it needs to refer that issue back to the regional office so that it can follow the proper channels up through the appeal process. They might also refer, again, if they just don't find that they have jurisdiction over the issue for some reason, um, but it will function similar to a remand in that it will send the issue back to the regional office. It can also dismiss issues that you elect to withdraw. Um, you need to be clear, just as you are in filing your appeals, if you want to withdraw an issue at the board, you need to be clear about what it is. The withdrawal needs to be informed. Um, we have issues on the flip side where the board finds that an issue has been withdrawn and so we argue that it's not, uh, that it wasn't premised upon a full understanding of the consequences of that action. But the bottom line is that if you want to get issues out of the board's focus, you can do that um, and they will dismiss those issues if you do so properly. If you get a board decision that you are not happy with, uh, a denial, you can file an appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims as long as you do so within 120 days. Again, very, very important to stick with the deadlines. Um, one of the worst feelings is when the, you know, the appeal is made just one day after the deadline, and sometimes there's no way to remedy that situation. Um, we do our best, but it's very, very important to get things done in a timely fashion and in the timelines that VA requires. If the board grants your claim, what you can expect next is another decision by the regional office. The next step will be a decision by the RO that will implement the board's grant. So for instance, if the board, if you have been pursuing service connection for tinnitus and you've appealed all the way to the board and the board says, we agree, you should have service connection for tinnitus, then the regional office needs to implement that grant. They need to assign a rating if the board has not done so. They need to assign an effective date if the board has not done so. So by the time it goes back to the regional office, unless the board has specifically laid out the grant in terms of the rating and the effective date, you can appeal the rating, uh, the rating decision that you get. So you won't be appealing the extent to the, uh, to the extent that the board decided you were entitled to service connection, but you might still want to appeal the rating assigned or the effective date. Um, that's just what that last part says. If the board is specific, if the board says, an increased rating for the back disability in the evaluation of 20%, but no higher is warranted from May 1st, 2007, then when it goes back to the regional office for implementation of the grant, you won't be able to appeal, uh, you won't be able to say then, well, I think I should have a higher rating. You can seek a higher rating, but your recourse is to go to the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. If the board has made the denial such that you, the, the regional office has no leeway, no say in the matter, you need to appeal the board's determination to the court. This is pretty much what that says. You have to appeal within 120 days. Um, and partial grants, so again, the situation where you're seeking a higher rating, maybe you have a service-connected psychiatric condition and you're seeking a 70 or a 100% rating, and you've appealed the issue, but you only are getting a 50% rating from the board. Um, maybe they're increasing your rating along the way, but if it's not high 
uh, high enough for what you want, you need to appeal that determination to the court, even if the board decision contains grants. Those grants won't be undone at the court, they'll stay in effect, but if you want um, more than what the board is giving you, your, your remedy is to go to the court. Remands cannot be appealed, so when the board remands a case to the regional office, um, it's basically just saying that it can't make a final decision without additional development of some kind. So you can't appeal those to court. Um, the development that the board might seek on remand or will order on remand could include service records, medical records, we talked about these before, sometimes nexus opinions if the issue is service connection, um, sometimes clarification of opinions, maybe the board will read a VA exam and say, I don't understand what this means, I need the examiner to restate this opinion in a way that makes sense or that contains the appropriate legal standard. If the board or if the, um, if on remand the benefit can be granted based on the new development that's ordered, the regional office can issue a rating decision to the extent that it wants to grant any benefits. If the benefit remains denied, then they will issue a supplemental statement of the case and the denied issue will proceed right back to the board. So the remand process in legacy, keep in mind that this is all in the old system, just in case that wasn't clear. Um, the remand process is good in some ways because if the regional office gets the development that the board ordered and the regional office still wants to deny the claim, it will just issue a supplemental statement of the case and you can go right back to the board for a new adjudication. The board at that point will decide whether its remand instructions were complied with, whether the regional office was correct to deny the claim, um, but you don't have to go through the whole appeal process again. So you do, if the board remands a case, you don't have to start back at square one with rating decision, notice of disagreement, statement of the case. You get to go right back to the board, which is obviously great because the appeal process can take a really long time. On the flip side, we do see sometimes that board remands and when the cases are sent back to the regional office in the legacy system, that can be a, a very lengthy process in and of itself. There's sort of a... In certain cases, we've seen it, not, not across the board, but sometimes there's like this black hole effect where your remand goes back to the regional office and they're supposed to do a bunch of stuff and they just don't do it. You have to really follow up. Um, they don't really have any deadlines. Um, so while we as uh, advocates and veterans themselves have very tight deadlines, the regional office won't be given a deadline to, to complete the remand instructions. So um, it's good that it can go back to the board, bad if it takes a long time for them to complete the development. About referrals, if the board notices in the example that I used that a new claim was raised but hasn't been adjudicated by a rating decision, they'll mm -hmm. give the agency of original jurisdiction or the regional office, can use them interchangeably, the ability to make a decision and have the first bite at the apple on that. This can also follow, uh, happen following board hearings if the issues um, that the person wants to talk about at the hearing are not the ones that have been on appeal for all these years. Some statistics about board decisions, we're seeing more of them, which is good. Um, hopefully that the quality and the quantity are on par. It's not just an increase in the number of bad decisions, but in fiscal year 2017, which ended in October of 2017, the board made 52,000 decisions give or take, but last year it made 85,000, and this year it has promised to make 90,000, and we think that we'll see closer to 100,000. So this is good. Um, I wonder, and I don't know this for sure, if this was in preparation for the new appeal system and with the goal of uh, decluttering the backlog and getting out of the old legacy appeals to try to transition fully to the new system in a more efficient way. Either way, more decisions um, is definitely good in the, uh, you know, in the world where someone is waiting for a decision for a very long time. So the reasons for appeals reform. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but just a few takeaways. In 2015, VBA had 425,000 appeals pending. The wait time was three years for an appeal to be adjudicated, and that was after the initial claim was filed, after the initial decision was made. So that's not even including all the time that it takes from the date of your claim to get an initial decision. Um, and with the number of appeals increasing, it was just looking like the wait time and the number of pending appeals would just be going up and up and up um, without any end in sight. And so um, in 2017, there was a government accountability office report, which gave some more specifics about the time frame. Um, as of 2017, regional offices were taking 
419 days from the receipt of a notice of disagreement to issue a statement of the case. Think back to what we were talking about with the statement of the case. It's just another denial. It has a lot more laws and regulations in it, but it's not always specific and it's not always very uh, a helpful reference for people who want to know why their claims have been denied. So you can imagine that that's very frustrating, that it takes over a year to issue that document. Um, after that, from receiving the VA Form 9, it, takes 500, it took, at that time, 537 days for the perfected appeal to just be certified to the board. That's not a decision. That's just to get the case pretty much up to the board's docket. That's a really long time within which not a ton is happening. Certain things are happening, uh, but not a ton. After certification, the appeal would be placed on the board's docket, but that took 222 days, just for that one step. And once it was docketed, the appeal could take 270 days before it was adjudicated by the board. Um, this is just a lot of days for a few steps in the process. Um, maybe that's an oversimplified view, but that's, that's how I see it. So something had to be done. VA signed the, or Congress signed, the Veterans Appeals Improvement and Modernization Act of 2017 in 2017. And under the new laws, the goal was to completely reform the appeals process, to make everything more streamlined and to give veterans more choices. Um, that is why we call the old cases legacy appeals. They're in the old system. And the AMA is in effect, as we mentioned before, as of February 19th, 2019. VA is making decisions pursuant to the new appeal system. And we're gonna talk now about what that is. So opting in, first of all, when can you get into the new system if that's what you wanna do? So say that you got a decision a while back, maybe you filed a notice of disagreement and you wanna know if you can um, opt into the new system. You can at the SOC or SSOC stages of your legacy appeal. So you can't do it um, when you're filing a notice of disagreement, you have to wait for the statement of the case, and then you can say, I would like to opt into the new appeal system. This is different from RAMP. Again, I'll talk about that later on. RAMP had a, a broader um, way to opt into that program. That program, uh, RAMP stands for the Rapid Appeals Modernization Program, and that was a bridge between legacy and the new system. Only a few of the lanes were open. We're gonna talk about lanes in a little bit, so uh, apologies if you're confused just now. Um, but that was supposed to be a way for uh, claimants and VA to test out this new system. If you get an initial rating decision in the new system, previously you would have to file a notice of disagreement. That would be the first step in filing your appeal. You would have to do so within one year. You would have to specify the issues that you were appealing. Now, you not only express disagreement with the rating decision, but you have to make a choice among three different lanes for appealing that decision. So it's no longer that linear process where everyone takes the same path. Now, you file a claim, you get an initial rating decision, and the choice is yours. It's like a choose your own adventure kind of thing. Um, lots of fun insight, I'm sure. So. You can choose either the supplemental claim lane, the higher level review lane, or the board review lane. I'm gonna break down what these are. Um, your deadline is still one year. Very important to keep in mind. So rating decision, still a one year appeal deadline. Um, but be mindful that there are going to be different forms for these different options. Um, VA will not accept certain appellate documents if they are not on their forms. So a good idea would be to get a hold of those. Um, from what I hear, they are not enclosing those forms with their decisions. So if you get a rating decision, they'll give you the choice of your three different lanes, but you need to grab the form that goes with your lane so that they will accept your appeal. This is what the new structure is gonna look like. Again, we are gonna talk about um, what this graphic translates to in terms of what are the choices and what do they mean. But again, you're not seeing this one path for everybody's system anymore. You're seeing a claim and a decision, and from there, um, there's lots of different options. Still the same ultimate end goal, um, not goal, but end possibility would be to get to the Board of Veterans Appeals, and from there you can still appeal to the courts, um, just the same as always. But within the VA, within the white box, that is uh, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the choices have totally changed. The first lane we'll talk about is the supplemental claim lane. So again, remember, we're talking about what you choose, what's available to you after you've filed a claim and you've gotten an initial rating decision. So if you submit new and relevant evidence in this supplemental claim lane, 
um, you will get a new decision from VA. So the supplemental claim lane is basically saying, um, I have more evidence to substantiate my claim. Please look at it and make a new decision. But the evidence has to be new and relevant. New means it was not before VA at the time they rendered their first rating decision. Relevant means that it tends to prove or disprove an issue that's central in your case. Um, so the supplemental claim lane is for you if you want to submit more evidence. There are other lanes that preclude the submission of additional evidence or at least uh, allow VA to proceed without considering it. So if you want to submit something new, if you filed your claim and you were waiting on a doctor's opinion and then you got it after the rating decision, you should probably think about choosing the supplemental claim lane. Of course, every case is different. I'm oversimplifying uh, the issues, but just for, for example purposes. The duty to assist applies in this lane, which implies that it doesn't apply in other lanes. And this is a, um, a pretty hot topic uh, in terms of thinking about appeals reform and thinking about the duty to assist, which was always there um, as a, a pretty pro-veteran provision. It's still there in some capacity. We'll talk about when it applies. But what you need to know for right now is that in the supplemental claim lane, VA will assist you in obtaining evidence in support of your claim. Um, again, this results in another rating decision. So if you choose the supplemental claim lane within a year of your first rating decision, you're going to get a new decision specifically that encompasses the new evidence that you've submitted, the new and relevant evidence that you've submitted. <laughs> the higher level review lane is a separate choice, very, very different than the supplemental claim lane. Um, in the higher level review lane, it functions similar to the DRO type review that we talked about before. So in this lane, you get a more experienced adjudicator looking at your case, but the duty to assist does not apply in this lane. So what does that mean? If you file a claim and your intention was for uh, VA to assist you in gathering evidence and they did that, but they issued a negative rating decision, your higher, higher level review lane doesn't allow you to make additional allegations of duty to assist errors unless they occurred prior to the rating decision. So this is very confusing. It's kind of hard for me even to wrap my mind around it, but pretty much you can't just make these ongoing freestanding duty to assist allegations of error. They have to pertain to the time period between filing your initial claim and getting an initial rating decision. Um, as it says here, when a duty to assist error is noted, the higher level reviewer could pick up on that type of error. But it's not something where you can say in the higher level review lane, the exam that you got wasn't adequate and uh, I want you to get a new exam at this point. It's, it's a little more nuanced than that. What you can do in the higher level review lane, I like to think of it as if you think that a, a mistake was made at the first rating decision, maybe they totally didn't consider a piece of evidence that's still in the file, and you just want somebody new to look at it because you think it's really good for your claim, you think it proves everything, it's going to lock the whole thing up, um, that might be an instance where you should select higher level review. Not much has changed, you just want a more experienced adjudicator looking at the case. You can also request an informal conference. Um, again, this could uh, post some delay, but if you want to talk to the adjudicator that's assigned, you have the option to do that. You cannot request a DRO hearing anymore, so that's a change. Um, higher level review, just like supplemental claim, also results in a rating decision. So comparing the two lanes, we talked a little bit about these pros and cons. Um, the supplemental claim lane is premised on your submission of new and relevant evidence. But the higher level review lane is not with the submission of new evidence. It's just with, um, please, somebody look at my case again and make a new decision. VA will assist you in the supplemental claim lane. The uh, higher level review lane, though, does not come with that type of assistance on an ongoing basis as, it, as old appeals did. Um, both are, uh, have the ability for a de novo review, um, but the, um, there's a, in the higher level review lane, there is full uh, difference of opinion authority, meaning that the new person who looks at the case can totally differ from the previous adjudicator. This is some, uh, a screen grab I took from, I believe, the board's training materials. So this is what they are um, breaking down these two lanes into. So I thought this might be helpful in terms of comparing the two. Um, obviously, like we talked about, supplemental claims if you need new evidence. Higher level review is if you don't need new evidence, you just want a new review. 
Both take on average 125 days to get a new decision. At least that's what's been uh, promised or estimated or the goal. We don't have enough data on that because it's only this whole system's only been in place for a month. Now the third lane is board review or the notice of disagreement lane. So notice that with the other two lanes, no notice of disagreement was required to opt into those lanes. It's just the uh, lane election. If you receive a rating decision and you just want to go right to the board, you don't have new and relevant evidence and so the supplemental claim lane isn't for you, or you think that this is a complex legal issue that even a higher level review adjudicator might not get, then maybe you want to just go straight to the board. And that will be done by filing a notice of disagreement, sort of like in the old legacy days. Filing a notice of disagreement gets you one step closer to the board. The one year deadline still applies. Um, but the nice thing, hopefully it will pan out this way, is that this removes the SOC, VA9, SSOC stages of the old system. So now you can file a notice of disagreement and that will perfect, I believe, your appeal to the board. Um, the result of this lane is not going to be a rating decision. So remember that with supplemental claim and higher level review, you are bound to get another rating decision. Not so in the board or notice of disagreement lane. In the board lane, you have three more options. So lots of options. Um, and this is like the rule of threes, I guess. So um, if you choose the notice of disagreement slash board lane, you have three choices for what kind of board docket you want to be on. And these all come with various pros and cons depending on what kind of case you're working on. You can choose the direct review docket where you will not be asking for a hearing and where you will not be submitting any new evidence. You just want the board to make a decision. You can choose the evidence docket within which you'll have a window of time to submit more evidence if you want. Or you can choose the hearing docket um, which will allow you to have a hearing before a, a VLJ at the board. And in the hearing lane, you can also submit more evidence within a certain number of days after the hearing occurs. This is just some comparisons. Um, I think everyone will have the PowerPoint as part of the materials that were provided, so <laughs> go back and look at these. Um, I think the comparisons might help to be the most enlightening about how the new system works. Um, but as we already talked about in the legacy system, um, your, your path to the board was not just premised on a notice of disagreement, but also on going through the SOC, VA-9, and the docketing and certification phases. Now in the new system, your notice of disagreement still has to be filed within a year, still has to clarify which issues you want to proceed to the board, uh, but you don't have to go through any of the extra VA-9, SOC um, steps. And one thing to note here, is that unlike in the legacy system where if the board decided to remand your case, it would retain jurisdiction. So we talked earlier about the, the remands back to the regional office might still result in a denial, so they would issue an SSOC and you'd go right back to the board. That's not the case anymore. So if you go to the board and you get a remand, you're going to get a, another decision from the regional office, but it's not gonna be a supplemental statement of the case and it's not going to proceed automatically back to the board. That's a big difference to note. This is just what the board lane looks like. <laughs> Hopefully this is helpful. Um, <laughs> and we're not just muddying the waters, but um, this is what generally, what we've already talked about. So once you have a decision, top left, you proceed to the right, NOD filed and docket elected, those are your three docket choices underneath there. Um, and then there are some, all the various possibilities of what could occur. The board might grant the claim, the board might deny the claim, in which case you could proceed back to the court, or they might remand the case back to the regional office for a new decision and for you to again choose supplemental claim, higher level review, NOD, all the choices that you have. Something to note though that I think is, is important in this slide is that if you get an adverse board decision, so the board totally denies the claim, it says service connection for whatever you're seeking cannot be granted, you can file an appeal and opt into the supplemental claim lane. If you can provide new and relevant evidence, you can do so within a year of even a board denial. So previously all board denials had to proceed to the court. That's not the case anymore. Even a denial doesn't mean that your appeal is over. Um, just another, another opportunity to emphasize how important it is to appeal, especially in the new system, uh, with all these different options and as things play out. So 
if you can pr uh, present new and relevant evidence that has uh, bearing on what the board denied that tends to actually prove the claim that wasn't in the record before, you should do that in the supplemental claim lane because you can preserve your effective date. You're still working with the same claim date, which is great. Another breakdown of which docket to choose. Uh, the direct docket is the simplest, the cleanest. You don't have anything new to submit. Uh, maybe you can submit more argument, but argument and evidence are not the same to VA. You can make arguments at any time. So if you just, if you just want a direct decision, um, people in our office call this the rocket docket. You just get right to the board uh, as quickly as possible. Um, if you have more evidence that you want to submit, choose the evidence docket. But be mindful that you can only do so within 90 days of your notice of disagreement. So be strategic about that. You cannot just submit new uh, evidence or evidence on the evidence docket at any time you want like you could in the old days. Um, you have 90 days from the notice of disagreement and anything you submit beyond that 90 days, VA is not under any obligation to consider it, rely on it, um, accept it. And then if you want a hearing, um, you can have the hearing plus 90 days from the date of your hearing to submit follow-up evidence. So oftentimes at hearings, things will come up. You'll mention certain pieces of evidence that you want to bring to VA's attention. They'll let you have 90 days from that date to do so. How long does it take to get a decision? This is very important. Um, still, even with the direct docket, they're still thinking an average of one year for a board decision. Evidence docket is over a year, so who knows what that means. And uh, the hearing docket is going to be even more uh, tricky. There are a lot of pending hearings, and I'm going to get to a couple slides from now. The board is working old legacy cases with priority to some extent. Um, so a lot of hearings are in their backlog already, and more will be in the new system. So that's definitely going to be uh, something to think about before choosing that lane. Board priorities, perfect. So the board is going to prioritize their decisions accordingly, at least from the information that we have. First, they're going to be trying to clear up the legacy appeals. Um, I think they may have been doing this previously with the increase in their decision numbers, uh, but that's what they'll continue to do. They're going to try to get the old system cases out of the way. Then they will do the legacy appeals that have the hearing option chosen. So they're going to get through the non-hearing cases first and then do the cases with hearings, and then they will proceed with the new AMA dockets in the order that you might have imagined based on you know, the, the work that's involved. So they'll get to the direct lane, they'll get to the evidence lane after that, or the evidence docket, I apologize, and then the hearings lane after that. Um, something to be mindful of is that if your case is advanced on the board's docket or you're successful in making a motion to have the case advanced on the docket due to the reasons that the board provides in the regulation, um, terminal illness on the part of the claimant, things like that, uh, those cases will still be given priority as usual. Can you switch lanes? So say you, you opt into a lane and you regret your choice and you want to you wanna change lanes. You can do that. Um, you must do so, though, within one year of your election. So be sure you're taking action within a year to switch lanes. If you choose higher level review, maybe, and then before you get a decision, you realize, I have this evidence now that I didn't even realize I had before. I think it's new and relevant, and I want to submit it. You can switch back to supplemental claim. That would probably be the best avenue for you to do that. Um, notwithstanding the board lane, but you have to do so within a year of choosing the higher level review lane in the first place. There are exceptions about outside the one year lane changes, but you have to show good cause. Um, and we're not really sure how that standard, that legal standard is gonna pan out. So best to do it within the year if at all possible. And continuing the appeal. Um, so there is the uh, option now that appeals could be stuck at the rating decision phase. Um, much longer than before because as you remember before, every step of the process was sort of a one-time deal and then you moved up the ladder. But now, if you have the option to switch lanes, um, so say you file an appeal that's a supplemental claim lane election, you get a decision, then you want to go to higher level review, you get another decision, then you want to go back to supplemental claim, and on and on and on, that's a possibility now with these at different options. Um, I hope that that doesn't happen often because I can't see why anyone would want to commit themselves to that kind of just hamster wheel. Um, so hopefully it doesn't become an issue, but it is something um, that's available in the new system, sort of a loophole in that if you're taking action within a year, um, you can continue on with the appeal and keep preserving that initial effective date. 
I do have some slides on ramp. I think I'm already over time, so I'm just gonna cruise through these. Um, we have this graphic that sort of describes what ramp was like for us at the time. Um, pardon all the traffic analogies, but VA kind of started it with the lane thing, so we're going with it. Um, ramp was, as I said before, that pilot program that was supposed to act as a bridge. Only the supplemental claim and higher level review lanes were open. The board lane wasn't open. So they would invite veterans to opt into ramp and the veterans would only be able to choose those two lanes. They couldn't choose going directly to the board lane. Um, that's why the Board of Veterans Appeals lane says closed, very, very nifty. Um, and eventually when ramp was in process, they did open the board lane, but not for some time after it first launched. Um, I'm gonna skip to some thoughts we have about ramp in review. Um, so approximately 75,000 appeals were transferred into ramp as of last November. The average processing time for a decision was approximately 119 days. That is within the 125 day goal that VA had. Um, so that's good, but it's just too early to tell whether those statistics are going to continue on with the full-scale launch of the new system. Um, RAMP ran through February 19, 2019. At that point, all RAMP cases just morphed into AMA cases. So if you see um, in going through your client's records or in going through a claims file that someone did opt into RAMP, that's a clue that that claim that they opted into RAMP is now in the new system. Some comparisons, um, I think I'm pretty short on time, but a couple minutes to go through these and then we can hopefully take some questions. Um, one thing that is very different under the AMA versus legacy is the ability to keep that effective date, especially when you think about the possibility of filing a supplemental claim with a board denial. Previously, board denials needed to be appealed to the court in order to um, keep the claim alive and now you can do so with other means, which is nice. Um, another thing is that factual findings, they're going to be more careful about making sure that those are not overturned during the appeal process. So one of the things that I didn't get to talk about a whole lot but that you can read about in the slides is that the uh, rating decision preparation procedures are supposed to be enhanced to provide more notice. So they are supposed to break down um, in a more detailed fashion what favorable findings they've made. So for instance, if your claim is service connection, they're supposed to make a favorable finding, if you have one, that the current disability element has been met. And that's supposed to be retained throughout the appeal process, rather than going up uh, with another adjudicator who might uh, go back on that and might say, actually, no, we don't think the current disability element has been met. They're supposed to delineate that stuff to you in writing, which is good. They're also supposed to list the things that you haven't submitted that are necessary to decide your claim. So they're supposed to give you more guidance as to how to prevail, um, which keeps with the non-adversarial, veteran-friendly nature of the system as it's supposed to be. Case development is different, especially with respect to the duty to assist. So as I said before, you can make duty to assist arguments, you can allege that there were du duty to assist errors, but it has to be within the time frame between the claim and the rating decision. Um, if you choose the higher level review lane and if you're in the supplemental claim lane, you have to be clear about what those issues are. Whereas before, you could submit evidence or a duty to assist type argument or request at any time. And as long as you did it before the board, the board would have to address it in their decision. The, in the old system, as I just mentioned, the record never closed. You could submit evidence at any time and VA would be bound to consider it. And now there are certain time periods when the record is closed. For instance, when you opt into higher level review, you can submit new evidence if you want, but VA does not have to consider it. If you opt to follow the evidence docket, you have a 90 day period from your notice of disagreement. You have to get your evidence in within that 90 days. Same thing with the hearing, it has to be 90 days after the hearing. As I mentioned before, there is a difference between evidence and argument. So if you're in the higher level review lane, you can submit an argument and it won't be construed as new evidence. You can explain to VA, to the new adjudicator, listen, this is what's going on in this case. This law applies. The previous rating decision didn't account for this law or didn't account for this evidence at all, but it's already in the file. Things like that are arguments. Those are not pieces of evidence. So when we talk about the time frames for submitting evidence, that doesn't exclude you from making arguments right before you believe a decision will be made to sort of, uh, for it to be fresh in the adjudicator's mind, what it is you're seeking and what your legal authority is. 
we talked about favorable findings already. We talked about effective dates. Um, and then I have a few more slides about attorney's fees that I'm not going to go to because I provided you with the slides. And hopefully, there aren't too many questions about that. Um, but does anyone have any questions now that maybe I can answer? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're supposed to look for all the evidence on the case. Is it the veteran or is it the service officer? The question was who's supposed to look for it? Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone that can that can find it. If if you're if you're a representative, um, you know you're you're supposed to be assisting the client in finding the evidence, or at least identifying for VA what evidence it is that's outstanding. Um, whoever can get to the evidence, I think, is probably the most prudent way to do it. Did you have a, a, something else in mind? Okay. Anyone else? Great. Thanks, everyone.